Hello all, this is Dr. Alsip, and we have moved to a different area of regional musculoskeletal anatomy, and we are going to focus on the bones of the neck and the back, then we will get into the joints and eventually make it into the muscles in this area. But let's start with bones as they are super foundational. And when we're talking about the bones in this regional area, we're really talking about two major ones. We are talking about the hyoid, and then we're gonna start exploring the vertebrae that are going to make up the vertebral column. So you can see there's considerable more um, to talk about regarding the vertebrae, so that will be the, the bulk of this video. But let's start with the hyoid bone. Uh, the hyoid bone is unique in the fact that it does not directly articulate with any other bone. It's going to be suspended from the styloid process by ligaments and muscles. Um, there will be other muscles in the anterior neck and kind of the right underneath the chin area that are going to attach to the hyoid bone, but certainly not a very direct articulation like you see in many other joints. So oftentimes you'll hear the hyoid bone referred to as free floating. You can see that the hyoid bone is an unpaired bone. It's going to be located between the mandible, which would be here, and the larynx. And if you are palpating your anterior neck, the, the first thing that you will feel is actually this right here, your laryngeal prominence, which is part of the larynx. But if you move superiorly, and I always kind of tilt my chin down and I can feel a little bit of the hyoid, it's certainly uh, more difficult to palpate than the larynx. This will play a role in terms of support of the tongue, and this is um, uh, through various means, so you kind of want to get the hyoid bone out of the way occasionally when you are um, swallowing. And this bone, as well as the cartilages of the larynx and the trachea, are often, but not always, fractured or damaged during strangulation. So close examination during autopsy when manual strangulation of this bone um, if manual strangulation is suspected, or the suspected cause of death, you want to kind of check to see if the hyoid has been fractured. Okay, so the rest of this video, we are going to focus on the vertebrae. And you've probably heard of the vertebral column or the spinal column. This is just these vertebrae, which are the actual bone plus its associated connective tissue. So you'll have a lot of connective tissue associated with the vertebrae, so you can have that really robust, very sturdy column um, that is going to play an important role in terms of protection of the spinal cord. So the spinal cord will run right through the vertebral column. So you'll have uh, bone surrounding the entirety of the spinal column. The joints of the vertebral column will also allow movement, so you'll have flexion of uh, certain areas. I always kind of like to think of flexion. Um, you kind of, let's see, if you, it would be going this away. Extension would be going back towards anatomical position. And then you can have lateral flexion, which would be kind of moving this way or this way. And then rotation, just kind of think if you're twisting your torso, that is going to be rotation. Also, very importantly, in terms of the vertebral column, this is going to be um, a point of attachment mainly for muscles. There will be joints that are associated throughout the vertebral column. We'll talk about that in the joints lecture of the neck and the back. But there will be lots of muscles that are going to attach on these processes and kind of throughout this whole region. Okay, there are five types of vertebrae. And um, the first three, these right here, are considered movable vertebrae. So there will be joints here that have not fused, and so there will be some form of movement allowed from the cervical, thoracic, and the lumbar vertebrae. Whereas the sacrum and the coccyx are vertebral bones that have fused, and they've formed uh, almost a separate bone, and you call these the sacrum and the coccyx. And I do want you to know the numbers or how many of each type there are. And to remember these, I always think um, of when you eat during the day. So you eat breakfast at 7 a.m. 
You eat lunch at 12, so 12 thoracic vertebrae, and you catch the early bird special, and there are five lumbar vertebrae, so you eat eight at these different times. And that kind of helps me. If that doesn't work for you, that's fine. You can find your own way of kind of getting those numbers down, but I always like to throw out what's worked for me in the past. So let's talk about some structures that are going to be common to most vertebrae. And so you'll see that they won't look exactly the same for each one of those categories, but um, they will at least have some form of these structures. And the first is going to be the vertebral body. And I like to start with this one because it is the most, usually the most dominant part or the largest part of the vertebrae. These are going to be anteriorly placed. So we're looking at a superior view as if we were looking down at the vertebrae. But the body's always going to be the more anterior, whereas the spinous process, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, are always going to be posterior. So these are anteriorly placed. These are the main weight-bearing component. You will have a layer of compact bone kind of all around it, but the majority of this um, portion of the vertebrae are going to be composed of spongy bone. So we'll talk a little bit about osteoarthritis, uh, and we did when we were talking about the bones, um, but the fact that this is almost all spongy bone can have big implications in an osteoarthritic individual and kind of breaking down these vertebral bodies or allowing them to collapse. Now moving a bit more posteriorly, you will have these little feet, i.e. the pedicles. So these are going to be these extensions these kind of processes that will project posteriorly and it will connect the body to the laminae. And I have laminae over here on this slide. So the laminae are these kind of thin plates of bone that will kind of close, help close off the uh, vertebral arch and kind of close off. This right here is the vertebral foramen or the neural foramen and this is actually where the spinal cord will run through. So you have this flat plate of bone here. If you're ever trying to access the spinal cord, you do what's referred to as a laminectomy in a lot of cases. And so what you would do is kind of cut through the lamina because it's such a thin portion of the bone. And you can kind of reflect that part of the bone back to get access to the spinal cord. Now projecting posterior laterally, you will have transverse processes. And transverse processes are quite different in terms of the length and even sometimes the shape, dependent on whether we're talking about a cervical vertebrae or, trans, or a thoracic or a lumbar. But they're all going to have some form of a transverse process. This is an important area in terms of attachment to both uh, different types of deep back muscles as well as bone, particularly if we're talking about the thoracic region and the ribs. And then lastly, uh, the most posteriorly projecting portion will be the spinous process. Um, and these are palpable. If you run your hand down your back, kind of right in that mid-region, you are palpating all the spinous processes of your vertebrae. Occasionally, these can be bifid in terms of being kind of split into two different parts. And we'll see that in the cervical region. Now, looking at a lateral view, one thing that you would note is that there are going to be these indentations uh, kind of just underneath or just above the pedicles, and these are referred to as notches. So you'll have superior vertebral notches and inferior vertebral notches, and if you were to put these together, you would be forming these intervertebral foramina. And you'll see these running all the way through the entire course of the spinal column or the vertebral column. And these are going to form what's referred to as intervertebral foramina. So these two notches come together and they will form these foramina. And these are extremely important in terms of passage or the means by which the spinal nerves will um, exit from the spinal cord and exit through the vertebral column and through these ver intervertebral foramina to get to their destinations. Okay, so let's talk about those different types of vertebrae. 
And we'll start with the cervical vertebrae, um, not only because they're the most superior, but because they are the most variable. And um, that's mainly because C1 and C2 are so unique, and we'll talk about those separately. But the cervical vertebrae are going to have a considerable range of movement, particularly in comparison to the thoracic vertebrae. And they are going to have some unique characteristics. And I'm actually going to start with this one first. Um, generally, uh, the cervical vertebrae 2 through 6 may have what's referred to as a bifid process, which I was talking to you uh, about in that previous slide of the spinous process. And really what that is, is you'd have kind of these two separate projections of the spinous process. But really for me, what is the most unique and characteristic thing about a cervical vertebrae is that they are going to have these transverse processes. So this little bitty thing right here is the transverse process of the cervical vertebrae. So not uh, very large, but they do have these foramina associated with it. And only cervical vertebrae have these. So it's very, very characteristic. If you have a transverse foramen, you know you're looking at a cervical vertebrae. And what's going to travel through here? So you know um, if there's a foramen, there's usually something traveling through there. It's actually not going to be a nerve like we had with the intervertebral foramen. It will be the vertebral artery. And the vertebral artery is going to be a branch of the subclavian artery. And it is going to ascend from the root of the neck up through the cervical vertebrae to get to the brain. So the vertebral artery is one of the two main sources of blood for the brain. So very important in terms of allowing that to travel up there. All right, I said I was going to talk about the two most distinct cervical vertebrae, and we'll start with C1. And C1, as you would think or you might understand because of the one, is the most superior of the cervical vertebrae. Sometimes you hear this referred to as the atlas. And this is because it is the atlas, or C1, that's going to articulate with the occipital condyles of the occipital bone. So in essence, this is what's articulating with the skull. And this forms the atlanto-occipital joint. This will allow us to have the movement of saying yes. So if you're shaking your head yes, you are moving your atlanto-occipital joint. You can see that it looks fairly distinct in the fact that it's just almost a its purpose is being this ring of bone. There's no real vertebral body or spinous process. But what do I have here? The, a transverse foramen on each side, so you know you're looking at a cervical vertebrae. C2 is also quite unique in the fact that it has, um, it's a fairly robust bone, but it has this projection here referred to as the dens. Sometimes you see this referred to as the odontoid process. And it will project, so this is actually C1 that we're looking at here, that ring of bone. And you can see the dens of C2 will project up into this region, creating the atlantoaxial joint, because sometimes C2 is referred to as ac the axis. And this will allow for rotational movement. So it will allow us to say no. So this is a pivot joint right here. So allowing, if you're shaking your head, no, 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 I don't like this. Um, you are moving your atlantoaxial joint. One other thing I want to note here, um, C7, which is the last or most inferior cervical vertebrae, is it's pretty characteristic of the other cervical vertebrae. But one thing I want to note here is it has the, the most posteriorly projecting spinous process. And so if you're ever trying to count vertebrae, and um, we'll talk about a few reasons in uh, later videos as to why you would want to know about at what vertebrae you're at. You can feel this spinous process because it's usually the most uh, prominent because it's the most posteriorly projecting. You can see some that are getting close to it as well. Oftentimes what uh, they'll tell somebody to do is to flex kind of their neck region and you'll see C7 kind of projecting further out than the rest. Okay, moving to the serv uh, excuse me, the thoracic vertebrae. There are 12 thoracic vertebrae and they will get progressively larger as you get more inferior. 
And the most um, characteristic thing about thoracic vertebrae are that you'll have longer transverse processes. And then on the bodies, vertebral bodies, as well as on the transverse processes, you will have these little divots or little facets, so smooth area of the bone, where you're going to have articulation with the ribs. So you can see it articulating with the body here and with the transverse process here. So you'll have two different areas of articulation with the ribs. And that is really something that is characteristic to the thoracic vertebrae. Only thoracic vertebrae will have articulation with the ribs. And they will be the only ones that have these facets on the bodies and the transverse processes. Because of this articulation with the ribs, there's less mobility in the thoracic vertebrae, but certainly still some. Um, but there's less than you would have in comparison to the cervical and lumbar vertebrae. And last but not least, you have your five lumbar vertebrae. These are identifiable mainly because they are quite large in comparison to the other vertebrae. Now say like T12, it's gonna be a pretty similar size to L1, but the rest are gonna be quite a bit smaller than the lumbar. So if you're getting kind of confused as to whether you're looking at kind of the end of the thoracics um, into the lumbars, I would look to make sure there are no costal facets because only thoracic vertebrae would have that. And then of course we know that only the cervical vertebrae will have transverse foramina. Now the immovable and the ones that have fused end of the vertebral column will be the sacrum and the coccyx. And while they are certainly part of the vertebral column, we will discuss these in the context of the pelvic girdle, so in those videos there. Okay, last but not least, I want to talk about the curvatures of the vertebral column. And these are natural. These are things that you want to have in your vertebrae. You will have the um, thoracic and sacral kyphoses, which is basically just kind of concave anteriorly. You can see that kind of here. Whereas with the cervical and lumbar region, it's going to be more concave posteriorly. And like I said, the normal curvature is, uh, is something that you want in terms of allowing the flexibility and the shock absorption that you need in the vertebral column. We'll talk about a few instances where it can be exaggerated and that would be pathological. But these normal curvatures are, as mentioned, normal. Um, there are going to be what's referred to as primary and secondary curvatures. If um, in a fetus, there is really only one curvature and it's going to be concave anteriorly. And um, primary curvatures are those that retain that kind of original curvature. So you have that in the thoracic region and in the sacral region. Secondary curvatures form later and they can be several months after birth. These are the results of from, ex, from extension from the fetal position. So if you think about it, think cervical and lumbar regions, what are some developmental landmarks that would help in terms of the development of these curvatures? Think about the cervical region. What's something that happens fairly early on um, that could help form this? Think about being able to keep one's head upright so if you always think you have to support a baby's head, one of the major landmarks is when a baby can support their own head. And so that can help in terms of the formation of the cervical um, curvature. And then think uh, lumbar region. What's something that could help with that or help form that? Being able to walk. So you will have these developmental landmarks what will help develop these curvatures. And usually all curvatures are formed by about the age of 10 in terms of what the normal curvature will be for the body. Now, there can be abnormal curvatures and some of these are just a, a, an extension or an excessive amount of the curvatures that already exist. Uh, one of the, the more common ones is a thoracic uh, kyphosis. And so that type of curvature, that normal curvature is kyphosis, but it can be excessive. And you can see here in the thoracic region that it 
it can uh, be a, a bit more of a curvature than what is typical. Sometimes you hear this referred to as dowager's hump. And you often see this in individuals that have um, very severe cases of osteoporosis. A lot of times you can have a collapse of the vertebral bodies in this region and cause an excessive amount of the th thoracic uh, kyphotic curvature. You also can have um, excessive lumbar lordosis. So you have that typical curvature in this region, um, but it can be increased, uh, particularly with a, a larger amount of anterior tilting of the pelvis. So this can often happen with weakened trunk musculature or sudden weight gain. Sometimes you see this uh, a bit more accentuated in individuals that are pregnant um, or individual, any individual that has a sudden amount of weight gain or change in terms of uh, what's going on with the pelvic regions or the lower abdominal region. And lastly, uh, there can be what's referred to as scoliosis. And this is an abnormal lateral curvature. So the other two that we talked about were just uh, uh, over accentuation of some of those curvatures or an excessive accentuation. Here we're talking about a different type of curvature that's not uh, one of the natural common types. And it will be some type of lateral curvature. So the vertebral column is moving too laterally in certain regions. And um, this usually occurs in the thoracic region, but it can occur in other regions as well. And this is one of the more common of the ab, the abnormal curvatures that can occur. And these can be um, either structural, meaning the, the ver vertebrae didn't form uh, in the most typical manner, so malformed vertebrae. You could have paralysis of muscles that kind of lead to the vertebrae being moved too far in one region. Or scoliosis can be idiopathic, meaning that it has an unknown cause. And so you can have very, uh, fairly extreme scoliosis, so uh, even further lateral curvatures or slight scoliosis. Okay, so that was a lot of vertebral column fun. We will talk joints uh, in the next video, so we'll really talk about some of those intervertebral joints. But before we leave, I want to review this question here. Which artery traverses the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae? Is it the basilar, the common carotid, the internal carotid, the subclavian, or the vertebral? And I know that you don't know all of these artery names quite yet. You will as we go throughout the year. So I did want to just introduce them. But a, a few key things I want to get at here. So we're talking transverse foramina. Transverse foramina are unique to the cervical vertebrae. You only have them in the cervical vertebrae. If you see a transverse foramen, you know you're looking at a cervical vertebrae. I've said that a bunch of times, right? It seems like something that might come up again, maybe in an assessment. But anytime you have a foramen, usually you should be thinking something is traveling through there. And so we're going to have an artery. And this will be uh, E, the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery is a branch of the subclavian artery, but the whole subclavian artery will not traverse the transverse foramina. And so vertebral artery is correct. It is one of the two main supplies of the brain, so very important. The internal carotid is the other main supply of the brain, but it is going to get into the skull uh, via different foramina associated uh, directly on the skull. So vertebral artery is the correct answer. And so I want to kind of introduce some of these terms. They'll come back up again, uh, particularly when you get into the vascular lectures later on. All right. Thank you for your time and attention here. Make sure that you review these concepts. And if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out to me. I love to talk about uh, these things, and I hope that we can start early and often with asking questions. Thanks for your time and attention. Have a great day.